Welcome Canhammer fans. So to prepare you for new edition, 8th edition Warhammer 40k, I'm making this video. I'm calling it a how to play, but it's kind of a little bit of a mix of how to play for new players to 40k entirely and how to change from 7th edition to 8th edition for players who've been playing uh, in the 7th edition. So I hope to cover uh, the core rules of the game only and uh, go through what has changed from 7th to 8th edition and highlight for existing players the changes, how it's been simplified, yet how it's still tactically deep and um, how it's kept that 40k flavor despite uh, changing its rules so significantly. So I hope to accomplish that for existing returning players. And for new players, I think you'll find that as I cover those aspects of the main rules, you're gonna be able to figure out how to play and see it in action as I demonstrate the, the core rules. Uh, so this video is not intended to cover the entire rulebook. It is only the core rules and how to play. It is my intention that after re uh, watching this video, you'll be able to grab some models and some dice and start playing right away. Um, and then if you want to get more deeper into it, well, of course, then you'll have to buy and read the rulebook. Of note, uh, pre-orders are up as of the day of filming, so June 3rd. I filmed this on June 3rd and pre-orders are up, so please pre-order and get your copies of Dark Imperium, the starter set, and any indexes that you want. And um, stay tuned to Canhammer for more coverage of 8th edition as uh, we get things rolling. So, uh, let's get going. So, uh, just a quick statement at the beginning that, about what you need to play. So, formerly what you needed to play was models of the army that you wanted to play, at least uh, the main rulebook, and maybe two or three, or maybe sometimes even more, number of codexes or supplements to cover all the rules for all the models that you had. Well, that's gone now. What you need to play is the core rulebook, and you don't even need that because the core rules will be available to download uh, off the Games Workshop website. Um, so what you need is the rules, and you need one book that covers your army. So there's five indexes now they're called. Imperium 1, Imperium 2, Xenos 1, Xenos 2, and Chaos. So your army will fall under one of those books, and that's the only book you need. It has all the models that you have and all the points in it. So that's it. You just need one book. You need some dice. You need a tape measure and um, a place to play and uh, that's literally it. Uh, so even starting to play and getting the stuff you need to play has become a lot simpler. So hopefully that's going to uh, get a lot more people into this game because that's what it's all about in the end, growing the game. So uh, what is a model? Well a model is just a single model. So this guy's a model this tank is a model, and this dreadnought is a model, okay? They're all models. Now what is a unit? A unit is a collection of models that can be just one model, but it can be, as stated under datasheet, a number of models that work together as a coherent force, okay? And so they do everything together, okay? And in fact, they have something that they have that, that's called coherency. They have to stay within two inches of each other, base to base, distance between the bases, and, and they always have to be in coherency because they're a unit and they can never separate, okay? If for some reason they do get separated by people dying or whatever, the next time they get an opportunity, they have to come back so that they're within coherency. So that coherency is a distance of two inches, as I said, between bases, and vertically, because this is a 3D game, you, you can be up to six inches apart vertically and you're still considered within coherency, okay? So that's the concept of model and units. And you'll see that when you read rules that some effects, uh, uh, some, uh, effects modify units and some effects modify individual models and that can mean models within units. For example, if a character has a buff here, let's say Ezekiel here has a buff that affects everybody within three inches gets this. 
every model within three inches gets this, then it would just be these, you know, six guys that get the buff and these other four guys and these two things don't get the buff. But if he said every unit within three inches gets the buff, then this whole unit gets the buff, even though some of the models are outside three inches because some of the unit is inside. And this rhino also gets the buff because it's within three inches. Okay, so um, uh, so that's how this concept of unit and models work. The data sheets is all you need to know about any particular model or unit. So it used to be that you had a data sheet and that told you the statistics and the rules that that model or unit had. Then to find out what those rules were, you had to go to another book or the rule book or two different books. And then to find out what the, the weapons and stuff did, then you had to go to some other books and some other books. It was really cumbersome. Um, so what this does now, this one data sheet basically has everything you need to know and all the rules for that model or unit right in one place okay so you see here the statistics all the profiles for all the weapons that it can that it can uh, have or upgrade to all the options it can take all of its special abilities and rules written out in full and then uh, what they have is these new keywords so uh, and then the you know fourth organization slot power level what it doesn't have on here are the points and the points are always at the back of the same book so all you have to do is flip to the back and you get the points so that is how eighth edition has simplified the rule book process by putting everything on the data sheet for the model itself and you'll see that if you had land speeder and then you have you have six different sheets for land speeders because there's land speeders with different variants then you'll see that in fact, a lot of the rules are, are, are exactly the same, and, but they've written them out on every single sheet. So um, that hopefully will make it easier for people in terms of number of books they have to buy and kind of finding the rules as they go. All you have to bring with you to the game is like the sheet, not the, all the different five or six books that you have to have to have all the rules. And that's so it's way easier. And just a note, uh, I just photocopied the pages of the index for easier reference so I don't flip through the book. Um, so uh, that's why I've got these pieces of paper. So this is a data sheet for a tactical squad. Tactical squad is sort of your basic space marine. And uh, what it tells you will go from the top. So this tells you that this is uh, this symbol means it's a troop choice. And when you go to make your armies, you have to put all your uh, models into detachments. It's kind of like army structures. And you always require a certain number of uh, troops, kind of like your basic uh, footmen. And so uh, that they fall under the category of troops. This five power is for uh, a narrative and casual play. And what it allows you to do is that this tactical squad is worth five power level. And so if you say to your opponent, I wanna play a game of 25 power level, then you can just say, okay, well, I'll bring a tactical squad that's five power level. So it's a very easy way of putting what you have on the table so that things are roughly evenly matched, okay? Um, and then you have the name of the unit here, and then you have the statistics. So these statistics will look familiar to uh, existing 40k players to the new players is pretty straightforward so the name of your um, uh, model and then uh, m is for movement and this is how far the model moves and this has changed in uh, eighth edition so now all models or units have uh, may have different movement characteristics so in seventh edition all foot soldiers moved six all vehicles could move 12. Um, it was it was categorized the movement you you could make was categorized based on what type of model you were not for the specific model and this uh, has been changed now so that every data sheet may have a different movement and this is way more representative of what different models can do you know there's no reason why my gene stealers which are super fast uh, can move at the same speed as a dude in heavy power armor. So now the gene stealers move faster than these dudes. Okay, so um, and um, that actually is way more realistic and also tactically 
way more important because movement is very important in 40k as it is in most tabletop gaming and uh, how you move is is really important in strategy and so that really adds to the complexity of the strategic aspect of the game weapon skill and ballistic skills a weapon skill is what you need to roll in order to hit in close combat ballistic skills what you need to roll in order to shoot and now it is this blanket number three plus or three plus uh, it used to be um, that you um, there was a table that converted it so your ballistic skill was four and then uh, that equated to uh, uh, three plus on shooting so it's been simplified it's just this number you have to roll and weapon skill used to be my weapon skill compared to your weapon skill then you consult a chart and then you have to work out what the number you need to roll is but now it's very simple just a weapon skill roll and that's it so that has been extremely simplified yet you do not lose really any of the um, any aspect of the of the game by doing that Next is strength and toughness. So strength is how hard your uh, models hit and toughness is how hard they are to wound. And so in uh, Age of Sigmar, for example, this was just replaced by a wound roll. Every attack or every weapon had a had a wound roll, just like a three plus or a four plus. And then so you had you were always able to wound something just based on that roll, no matter how small or weak you were versus how small or weak your target was, which is works in Sigmar. But for 40k, we've always had a sort of strength toughness kind of comparison in seventh edition. So if your strength is higher than your toughness, you, you it's easier for you to wound and vice versa and so they've kept that in this in this edition strength versus toughness when you're rolling to wound and you your what you need to roll depends on that difference but they simplified it to just four things so if you're equal the four plus 50 50 chance of your equal strength and toughness if you're greater if your strength is greater than toughness you're not wounding on three plus and if you're double the toughness you're wounding on two plus and there's no more instant death um, which was a silly mechanic and then if you're uh, weaker than the toughness then it's a five plus and if you're twice as weak then it's a, a six plus so that's it that's as simple as that and you, know, you compare those two things and what it allows us to do with that system is that now strength and toughness can get, go beyond 10. 10 used to be the max for all the stats and no longer is. So now you can have things that are super, super strong and things that are super, super tough. So um, that's uh, uh, increased the tactical and strategic flexibility in, the, in that area. Um, so next is wounds. So this is wounds, the number of damage uh, that the, your model can take before it's dead. And uh, uh, when we talk about the rhino, uh, you'll see that, in fact, uh, things that used to have hull points, so vehicles and things, everybody's just got wounds now. So that's very uniform, and that allows us to really kind of make things weak or strong based on how many wounds they have. And some things have many, many, many wounds. Um, next is A, so attacks. So this is the number of attacks that you make in close combat. This doesn't have anything to do with shooting. Your number of shots you make is in the weapon profile itself. So attacks is just close combat attacks. And uh, that's how many you make when you're in close combat. Uh, leadership, so leadership is uh, sort of how, what the mental will of your uh, models or units are. And um, this affects whether you run or not at the end of the turn, depending on how much damage you've taken. We'll cover that as we go. And then SV is save. So the save is just your armor save. So this is the uh, dice roll you need to make in order to negate damage taken. And of course there are powerful weapons that can negate the armor save. So that's your basic armor save uh, there. And so that's the stats. And everybody's stats is the same. Everybody, every model and unit in the game has the same stat line. There's no more different stat lines for vehicles or flyers. And it's everybody's the same, which makes it a lot easier. A little blurb below the stat line tells you how many models are in a unit. So here it tells you that you get a sergeant and four space marines in a unit, and then you can have up to five additional space marines, but you pay extra power and extra points when we talk about points. And then it tells you all the, what the basic armaments of each person is, although sometimes you have to pay for those. Okay, and you can look in the points list for that. Um, and then down below there is all the weapons that they can equip, including upgrade weapons and what they do. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the shooting phase. Then they talk about here what weapons can be replaced by what weapons and what can be upgraded to what. So that's all written there. And then down here you have a listing of all their abilities. So you see here that um, 
uh, the tactical squad has this and they shall know no fear and it says on page 10 where this is so this the only time you see a reference to a rule that's written somewhere else is when it's the main ability of a particular faction because they literally didn't they wrote that right at the beginning of your book they don't need to keep spitting it out every time um, so that's the only time you're going to see that all other times you're going to see this the rule and the rule written out for you so it's easier to reference okay so they really tried to cut down uh, page flipping and book flipping uh, for rules and then here it says this ability combat squads okay and then the final two things are very important so the faction keywords and the keywords so the faction keywords all the models in the game are split into factions so this is like your um your allegiances or your 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 armies basically so we have imperium armies we have xenos armies and we have uh tyranids gene stealers we have uh, tau Eldar, we got Chaos, you know, these are all the factions, and usually there's a number of factions, so there's the main overarching faction, so all the Imperium are have this faction keyword of Imperium, and then within the Imperium, there's lots of different sub-factions, so Adeptus Astartes, so that's Space Marines, then you can have like uh, Custodes, you can have Astra Militarum, you can have all the different armies you can play that are Imperial armies, they have this uh, sub-faction there that and that is there and then if they have a sub subdivision so for space marines the different chapters that you can have then it will be written there or if it's just generic and you can pick whatever chapter or sub faction you want it's just in these sort of triangular brackets there okay so the tactical squad is imperial firstly then it's a space marine or adept as a starty sub faction and then it can be in any chapter because you can put a tactical squad into any chapter that you want or even make up your own chapter so that's what these faction keywords do and what does that that affects how you what armies how you make your armies that affects what things you can put together in detachments and in armies and that affects abilities that affect certain keywords so everything if they have an effect usually affects a keyword and if you don't have that effect or if you have that effect it will determine whether you benefit or not from those buffs or debuffs and then finally this just keywords so these are keywords that indicate uh, what your unit or model is so these guys are infantry and they're tactical squads so some of these may not have a lot of bearing right now there may not be rules that affect it right now and some people are like well where's the rule for this keyword the keywords don't have rules the keywords just tell you what these guys are and there may or may not be things in the game that affect those keywords for example by the fact that you're infantry, it means things like rhinos can carry you. All right, If you're not infantry, you can't go on a rhino. If you're infantry, certain buffs will affect you or your apothecary can heal you. But if you're not infantry, those things don't work on you. So some of these keywords do have effects and some of them don't yet and may not ever. But it's just a description that you can use to sort and categorize your models. Okay, so so that's what that keyword is so i hope that uh, helps with people a bit confused it'll say jetpack if there's no universal special rule for what a jetpack does but there's not it's just that it's a jetpack type of model and maybe in the future there may be some things or your army gets another book that says all jetpack guys can do this and so then that will come into effect but as of right now some of the keywords don't have any effect they're just descriptive terms okay so that's a basic data sheet for the tactical squad uh, I won't go through them all I'll just point out some other things so the dreadnought here so this symbol up here shows you that the dreadnought is actually an elite slot so he's not a troop he's an elite he's seven power obviously he's a little bit more powerful than tactical squad and um, these are his statistics so he's a little bit tougher than a tactical squad and then he has a lot more weapon options and he has uh, these other abilities so just if you're coming back from seventh edition so there's no more hull points okay so dreadnoughts can no longer be exploded with one shot or immobilized with a grav cannon you have to take them all the way down um, and uh, so they become a lot harder to kill um, and there's no more hull points and there's no more uh, vehicle effects you can't immobilize people and stuff like that now all that happens is when the thing dies uh, on a six it explodes and it can suffer mortal wounds to the opponent so that's kind of the explosion and most vehicles have that rule now but you have to kill it in order to cause that and uh, here we go so in terms of faction so again he's imperial he's space marines any chapter and then he's a vehicle okay and he's a, a vehicle type called a dreadnought okay and uh there you go so that's a, an example of a dreadnought data sheet 
Uh, we'll talk about Ezekiel next. So Ezekiel is a, the skull symbol indicates that he's an HQ. So uh, that's the slot he takes up. There's his statistics. Those are his weapons and abilities, uh, uh, etc. And down here it says Psyker. So he is considered a Psyker and you see that in his faction type keyword. So he's a character. Uh, and he's infantry, he's a librarian, and he's a psyker, and he's Ezekiel. So some of these don't matter right now, like librarian and Ezekiel is just his name. But the fact that he's a character matters, the fact that he's infantry matters, the fact that he's a psyker matters. And so here it tells you what the psyker does. It tells you how many psychic powers you can uh, cast, and then how many you can deny every psychic phase. Okay, it's not uh, nothing. No mastery levels are all gone, um, and um, it just tells you how many you can cast and how many you can try and deny. And then all psychers know this smite power, which is covered in the rule book. And then it know he knows three other powers from this discipline. And so I'll just go over that now. So the psychic disciplines have been changed. So it used to be that if you were Space Marine, you could pick from 60 different psychic powers and roll for them all, and it would take you 15 minutes to figure that out. Now every faction has its own, most of the factions have its own psychic powers, okay? And it tells you here which one that is. So Ezekiel, he's a Dark Angel, so he can only cast Interomancy Discipline, okay? And so the Interomancy Discipline, which used to be six powers, is now this. Three powers, which you roll a D3, four, or your pick, okay? And all the psychic disciplines are now just three powers, okay? So, and here they are. And so now, uh, the what it is, is the name. And then uh, we'll go over the rest of this in the psychic phase, but that's it. Now, that's the psychic disciplines have been reduced to three powers, and smite, which is a generic power that every psyker can cast. So that's Ezekiel. So finally, we're going to go over the Rhino. So the Rhino is here. You see it is a dedicated transport. Uh, so, and that to we'll skip to the bottom, the keywords are that it's a vehicle, like the Dreadnought was, and it's a transport, which so that means it can carry models, okay? And then it's a Rhino. And again, it's Imperium, Space Marines, and any chapter you want. So when you look at some vehicles and monsters, um, stat sheets you'll notice that some of these are replaced by stars so his movement ballistic skill and attacks is just a star value um and uh, so what does that mean well these values change they decrease as the model takes damage so actually my photocopy is bad i missed out the attacks but there should be attacks going down here so it shows here that when it gets half dead it drops its movement from 12 to 6 and its ballistic skill from 3 to 4 plus. And then again, when it gets almost dead, drops to 3 inch movement and a 5 plus ballistic skill and the attacks go down as well. So this show this is the new way that some vehicles work. You know, the vehicles that used to have a lot of hull points, now they just take damage as they go, which is very realistic. And then, um, and that's it. So you can't one-shot these guys anymore. Well, unless you happen to do enough damage to do 10 wounds. Um, um, but and they're a lot harder to kill so toughness 7 wounds are 10 and they also have a strength and number of attacks because vehicles can now attack in close combat so watch out for that vehicles can tie you down in close combat whereas before you were welcome to attack a vehicle whenever and they couldn't do anything back to you so vehicles can attack and tie you down in close combat that's a big change from 7th and uh, they also have saves now. So no gone as in the dreadnought, gone are the hull points and the status effects. Now they have a save and they have wounds and they take damage and, uh, and that. Otherwise the data sheet is almost exactly the same. Again, as I said on the dreadnought, every vehicle has this explodes rule. And then here it says because it's a transport, it can transport 10 models and it tells you what keywords it can transport. So any chapter from Space Marines any infantry models only, so that's where infantry comes in. And it cannot transport anything that has a keyword of jump pack, terminator, primaris, or centurion. Okay, so there you go. That's where those keywords, those type keywords, uh, start to come into effect. Okay, so that's the new way of vehicles. And uh, in my opinion, it is way better and vehicles are going to be much more important in this game rather than just fragile boxes. All right, so there we go. So those are all the data sheets um, and uh, that I have. I don't, I'm not gonna show you every single data sheet, but that just tells you what's on every data sheet. And I hope that's, that's pretty straightforward.
So every game of 40k is composed of at least five battle rounds. During each battle round, each player gets a turn. Okay, so those are important phrases to use. So, uh, so battle round one, turn one, and turn one for the other player. Okay, so each player gets a turn in each battle round, and a game is at least five battle rounds. And just like in seventh edition, at the end of five battle rounds, depending on the mission, you may get to roll to see if it goes to six or seven battle rounds, and seven is the max. Okay, so. Um, and then after determining who goes first, and there's a process for that, then you just take your turns. Turn one for one player, turn two, turn one for the other player, and then back and forth, back and forth. There's no initiative roll or possible double turning like you have in Age of Sigmar. Um, so that stayed very much 40k. Uh, each battle round will sound very familiar uh, to, to 40k players. So the battle round starts with a movement phase where everything can move and advance. Then it goes into the psychic phase where you can cast your psychic powers. Then it goes into shooting phase where you can shoot all your weapons. Then it goes into the charge phase where you declare and make all your close combat charges. Then it goes into the fight phase where you fight all your close combats. And then it goes into the morale phase, okay? And that is basically a whole turn um, for, uh, for 40k. Um, and that is very similar in structure to 7th edition. But you'll see that every uh, every turn has really been every phase has really been sort of pared down uh, to make it simpler to play. Okay, so we're going to talk about the movement phase. So the movement phase is where you can move your models, and it's fairly straightforward. You look on the data sheet for your models, and it tells you how far things can move. Okay, so let's move our. It's the Dark Angel's turn. Let's move our tactical marines. So that says here that tactical marines, space marine moves six, and the sergeant also moves six. So we're gonna move our space marine six. So when you move, your whole unit moves at one time. So this, these guys can move six. So uh, we're going to move them six. Now, uh, the only rule about movement is that you have to stay in coherency, so two inches between bases, and you have cannot move closer than one inch towards an enemy model. Okay, so you always have to stay an inch away from an enemy model at any time during your move. So uh, you can't even swing through like that and end up an inch away. You always have to be an inch away so you have to go around things, okay? So these guys can move six, which takes us to just outside an inch away from these guys. So they don't want to get so close to the gene stealers. So they're just gonna move three inches, okay? And different models can move different uh, number of inches, they don't all have to move the same as long as they stay within their movement allowance and they stay within coherency. So these guys move forward three and everyone else can kind of move forward three. And they're going to meet this gene stealer charge with a little bit of a gun line. So these guys are a bit further back so they can move six to get up closer. So the guy with the melt gun is going to move there and that guy can move there and the last cannon is going to move there. So the next thing that can move is Ezekiel. So he's a character, so he stays by himself. Characters can no longer join units. The characters always remain independent, and so they have to do everything by themselves, okay? So Ezekiel uh, can move six as well. So he's just gonna tuck himself into there, okay? Stay behind his troops so he's well protected. So, um, Finally, we have this rhino. So the rhino is back here. The rhino has a movement of 12 if it's undamaged. So gone are vehicle speeds, the cruising speeds, whatever speed, whatever speed, all those things are gone. It can just move 12 and it can shoot and do everything as normal um, and regardless of how far or fast it moves. So the rhino doesn't need to really get that involved. He's just gonna tuck in here behind his troops to give them support. Now, you might ask, where's our dreadnought? Our dreadnought is a little bit slow. He's way over here. <laughs> so he needs to do some catching up to get in to the uh, fight. So what he's gonna do, his uh, movement ability is six. So, but six only gets him to here. That's not very far. He wants to get up to here. Sorry about that. He's so slow, he's off the screen. So what can he do to try and catch up? Well, if he gives up the ability to charge and to shoot this turn, 
he can do what's called in the movement phase advancing. And this is equivalent to the old 7th edition run, okay? The only difference is now you run at the in your movement phase, so you just run right after your movement, and uh, but it has the same restrictions. If you run, you can't shoot, and you can't charge unless something specifically says you can, okay? So uh, what he's going to do is run, and run is very simple. Everybody that wants to run just rolls a d6, and that's how far extra they move. So we roll a six, so our dreadnought's really coming up here. He gets to move a further six, so he has advanced up. He's moved a total of 12 inches, and he is right on the front lines now, but he can't shoot or charge because he advanced, okay? And that's the movement phase. It's very straightforward. Um, some models have a minimum movement, and those are usually flyers. So flyers, like planes, they can't move one. They have a minimum movement of whatever number of inches, so you always have to move at least that number of inches with flyers, and if you can't, so you're blocked, then uh, you die. It's very hardcore, but that's the way it is. Um, and then um, there's another type of movement called falling back, which we'll cover um right now so let's say that these guys were locked in combat okay so they're within one inch of each other because they're fighting okay everybody's fighting here and uh so they're they're kind of in a combat so now unlike the previous 40k where you're locked in combat until either you fail a morale test or everybody dies now in your movement phase you can leave that combat if you like by doing what's called a fallback move okay and what a fallback move is is you just decide to leave the combat and you have to, and you just move away from your your opponents and you can do that in any way up to your movement characteristic um and as long as you end your move outside of one inch of all enemy models so you could literally just fall back like an inch and then that would count as a fallback move, okay? Or you can move six inches, you know, as far away as possible. It's up to you. But that's what falling back is. And now these guys are no longer in combat. And But when you fall back, the penalty for that is that you can't advance, you can't shoot, and you can't charge. Okay? So that's your whole turn is falling back, okay? And what that means is in your opponent's next turn, these guys are not in combat anymore. They're free to do whatever they want, including just come straight back in, okay? So falling back can be a very strategic thing to do if you use it wisely. Uh, and sometimes to get your models out of combat and you can always sneak some new models in into combat. So this is a way that tactically um, going in and out of combat has become much more strategic as opposed to in 7th edition where you could lock things in combat forever just with things that don't die. So so that is a, a strategic and tactical change to the game. So that's falling back. And um, uh, the same thing still exists in terms of wobbly models. So, so let's say my Rhino now. Let's talk about wobbly models. So it used to be that my Rhino could drive over this rune and all it had to do was take a, what's called a difficult terrain, and if I rolled a 1, it would be stuck there. That is no longer the case. My Rhino, unless we say that this terrain is impassable, um, my Rhino can just ride right over it, you know, within reason. It's not going to go over a massive building. It can just drive over it, or maybe more realistically, drive over this rough part, and nothing will happen to it, okay? <laughs> this is... Uh, 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 a benefit for my rhinos they can no longer become useless just by driving over this tiny little bit of rock i mean it's a freaking tank after all so though all those rules of difficult and dangerous terrain and and uh, immobilizing and vehicles all that stuff is gone okay but wobbly models still exist so if i put my rhino here and it can't balance here then i can just put it here and we just know that it's there okay so that my models don't get damaged so wobbly model is still a thing Okay, so that's the movement phase, very simple. And then in the uh, Gene Stealers phase, they will get also the same movement and ability to advance, okay? All right, let's move on to the Psychic phase. So the Psychic phase has been hugely simplified and in my opinion, made a lot better and smoother and less of a time sink. Uh, Psychics was very powerful in seventh and it is still strong, and but its use is much more tactical now and way simpler. So what you gotta do in the Psychic phase, if, if you have no units that are Psychers, and if you remember on Ezekiel's data sheet, it said it was a Psyker and here on this Magus data sheet, you see that he is a 
psyker. So if you have no psychers, then you don't participate in the psychic phase, just like before. But if you have a psyker, you can do the psychic phase. So what do you do? Well, we already uh, showed you how you get, how many powers you have, how many you can deny, and wh where you get your powers from. So Ezekiel here, uh, in the Dark Angels, turn one, after they move, is going to cast some powers. So what you do is you choose your psyker, so I only have one, Ezekiel. You choose what power that you want to cast. And so if you remember, Ezekiel knows all the powers, all three of these powers, and he also knows the smite power. So smite, let's talk about smite for a second. Smite is uh, basically like Arcane Bolt from Age of Sigmar. So this is a new power that we ported over from Age of Sigmar. Every single Psyker knows smite, and basically uh, it's a, a, a power that allows you to shoot a bolt of psychic strength at somebody. And so psychic powers all have uh, a name, and they all have what's called a warp charge value. So this is the number that you need to roll equal or greater than in order to manifest this power. Okay, and then it tells you what the power does. So there's usually a range that either targets yourself or your or a unit, either friendly or enemy, and then it tells you what it does. Okay, and these are all the powers. So uh, smite is a warp charge power five. And uh, what it does is if you get it off successfully, the opponent suffers some damage. So um, let's try and cast a few psychic powers. So Ezekiel can cast uh, two, I believe. Where's his data sheet? So it will show you on the data sheet. So Ezekiel can attempt to manifest two psychic powers in each friendly psychic phase and attempt to deny two. So he's going to try to cast two powers. First of all, he's going to cast Smite. So to cast your power, you um, have to roll equal to or greater than the warp charge value of the spell. So Smite was warp charge value 5. So on 2, you roll 2d6, and you have to equal or beat 5. So here we go. All right. So he rolled 6, so he would successfully cast Smite. And okay, so the power has gone off. So he's pick a unit within... Um, 18 inches, so he's going to target this unit of gene stealers. Okay, so they're well within 18 inches and uh, they can be targeted. Oh, yeah, there's only like six inches away. So now what comes is something called uh, Deny the Witch. So this is uh, the same as 7th edition Deny the Witch, but this is how it works now. If you have your own Psyker and you're being targeted, uh, if your Psyker is within 24 inches of the Psyker that just cast a power, whether or not you're the target or not, or within range of the unit that's getting cast, just your Psyker needs to be within 24 inches of the casting Psyker, which this Magus is, who just appeared by the way, I put this Magus in for this purpose, um, you can try and deny the Witch. And all you have to do to deny the Witch is take your 2d6 and roll greater than whatever that Psyker rolled and then that power goes uh, is gets denied. Okay, so here we go. The Magus is going to try and deny uh, this power. And according to the data sheet of the Magus, he can only deny one power each turn. So you got to choose um, what you want to try and deny. So he's going to try deny. And so the Magus rolled the 11. That is way higher than the 6 that Ezekiel rolled. So that power is denied and nothing happens. Okay. Now let's say the Magus failed, let's say he rolled a 2 and he didn't deny, then the power would go off and this Gene Stealer models would suffer some damage, D3 mortal wounds. We'll cover what that means when we talk about damage, but that's what would happen and then that psychic power would be done and then uh, Ezekiel can go on and cast another power. So let's see, he knows the Enteromancy powers, so let's decide what we want to cast. So, uh... So let's cast this power, Aversion. So Aversion is the warp charge value of 6. If manifested, enemy unit within 24 inches of the Psyker, uh, until your next Psychic phase, your opponent subtract 1 from all the hit rolls made for that unit. That's pretty good because these Gene Stealers are pretty hardcore in, in combat. So we're going to try and cast Aversion on them. So for 6, warp charge of 6. Alright, so he rolled an 8. So that goes off. Now, the Magus cannot deny because he already used up his one deny attempt on the other power. So, Aversion goes off. This unit now has minus one to hit until my next Psychic Phase. So, it'd be nice to put a little counter there to remember that, but I'll remember. So, uh, and that's it. Ezekiel cannot cast more than two powers, and so the Psychic Phase is done. Now, let's say when he cast Aversion, he rolled Snake Eyes. Or he rolled... 
double six. So if you roll snake eyes or double six on your uh, manifesting roll, then you suffer perils. So perils of the warp is the warp kind of getting into your mind. You've overdone it and it's going to do some damage to you. So um, previously, um, you know, the mechanism was all different and you had to roll on a chart and everything. So now perils has been simplified and is actually a little bit hardcore. So if you peril, you um, immediately suffer perils of the warp. The Psyker takes D3 mortal wounds, so that's that's mortal wounds we'll talk about in a second as I say, but basically there's nothing you can do to prevent that. And then if the Psyker dies as a result of that, not only does the spell then fail, but every unit within 6 inches would also suffer D3 mortal wounds. So Perils is pretty hardcore now. Um, and so you gotta be, don't get unlucky, it's just luck now unfortunately. Don't get unlucky and roll boxcars or snake eyes. Um, so the only thing to say is, so if you Perils but you, but you don't die, the power still goes off. You still suffer the wounds, but the power still goes off. If you Perils and you die, the power doesn't go off, okay? So that's what Perils is now. So that's it, that's the whole psychic phase. Um, and uh, that is pretty straightforward compared to previously. So, okay, shooting phase. So shooting phase is where you can shoot all your ranged weapons. So how you do this is you choose the unit that's going to shoot. So remember, you're only eligible to shoot if you didn't fall back and if you didn't advance and if you're not within an inch of an enemy, so you're not locked in combat, okay? Um, so, and if you have a ranged weapon. So if you meet all those criteria, then you can shoot. And uh, your unit shoots as a whole, and then you move on to the next unit, okay? So the next thing you have to do then is choose your target. So your target must be visible to you, okay? And it must be within the range of the weapon that you're using. For example, these guys have bolt guns and the range of a bolt gun is 24 inches. So obviously we're in range here, but if you're outside a 24 inch range, then you can't shoot that weapon at that target, okay? Um, some, uh, rep so pistols, for example, you can use when you're within an inch of the enemy models. So formerly you could use pistols at range uh, and they just count as a close combat attack in seventh edition. But now pistols actually count as a shooting attack while you're in combat, but you can only shoot the nearest model. So usually that's the model that you're locked in combat with. So that's how pistols have been changed. And in fact, if you want to shoot with a pistol in, in the shooting phase and you're not in combat, then you have to shoot the pistol instead of another weapon, okay? The final thing to say about choosing your target is you cannot shoot at units that are within one inch of friendly units. Okay, so i.e. you can't shoot at units that are that are in combat uh, unless you are also in combat with that unit. Okay, in which case then it doesn't matter if you, another unit is in combat as well. Um, and then you can only use your pistols. So, so that's another rule. So next you, you choose the ranged weapons that you have, and if you have two ranged weapons, you can shoot both ranged weapons. There's no longer uh, uh, restrictions on how many weapons you can use as long as you're armed with both of them and they're not pistols. Um, and then you can also choose to, to change who you shoot to. So there's no longer a split fire rule that you have to have to shoot at different uh, units. The tactical squad is a true uh, uh, Swiss Army knife unit now, so the boulders could shoot at them, the las cannon here could shoot at something else, the melted gun could shoot at something else, uh, you could have half the bolt gun shoot there and half the bolt gun shoot there. It, you can do whatever you want with your ranged weapons now. The final thing to say is when you're shooting, you cannot shoot a character unless it is the unless it is the closest model. So for example, if this Magus is here, okay, so these Marines can't shoot this character because this is the way that you in the in, you know you don't skip over all these guys are about to eat you and shoot the character that's the fluff reason for not being able to shoot the character but really is to prevent sniping of characters as they now can't join units okay so if your character has less than 10 wounds which a lot of them do you cannot choose to shoot the character unless the character is the closest model and then you can shoot it okay Similarly, if these gene seals could shoot, which they can't, they could not shoot Ezekiel because he's not the closest model. There are some units or abilities 
uh, or weapons that do allow you to snipe characters, but by and large, most weapons don't. <clears throat> So that's another way that moving and shooting becomes very tactical if you want to take out characters, okay? So that's another important change in terms of characters. So let's go straight on to shooting then. So these Space Marines, there's uh, nine, there's eight bolt guns in this unit, and they're going to shoot at these gene stealers because they're within range, they can see them, and um, they want to take care of some of them. So let's see what happens. So the bolt gun here, so as we said, 24 inch range, so they're within range. Uh, they are strength four, uh, AP, and damage. So let's go over uh, shooting profile for a second. So range is obvious, type. So there's four main types of shooting weapons. One is, as you see there on the bolt gun, rapid fire. So what this means is that if you're within half range of that weapon, so 24 inch on the bolt gun, so if you're within 12 inches of the bolt gun, they double the number of attacks that they make. So that's what rapid fire means. Uh, an assault weapon is one that allows you to shoot even after you've advanced, but if you do that, you shoot with a minus one to hit. Okay, so that's the assault weapons. Heavy weapons, similarly, these are super heavy weapons that if you move in the movement phase, you can still shoot it, but you shoot at minus one to hit. Okay, and those are heavy weapons. And then uh, pistols we already talked about. And then there's grenades. So grenades, one person in your unit can have a grenade and they can choose to throw that instead of shooting their normal weapon. So that's it. That is really simplified the weapon types. There's no more salvo and all these sort of silly things. It's literally, you just shoot, you double it if you're a rapid fire within half range and you minus one to hit if you're heavy or uh, if you're shooting after advancing with an assault weapon. That's straightforward. So the bulk gun is rapid fire. Uh, so sorry. So uh, going back to profile, so strength is the strength of the shot. And again, you compare that to the toughness as you'll see. AP is armor penetration. So gone are the armor penetration uh, comparing to armor save sort of system. Now all the armor penetration does is it uh, gives you a minus to the armor save. That's it. That's all armor penetration does now. It's very straightforward. And this has simplified that system immensely and has also um, improved the granularity of people's armor. So, for example, it used to be that if you're AP2 and you never got an armor save. So, Terminators would be screwed by AP2 weapons. But now it's just minus two or minus three uh, armor penetration. So, those Terminators would still get a four plus or a five plus save. So, um, that's what armor penetration is now. And then this is how much damage each. A uh, wound does, so a wound from a bolt gun just does one damage, but a wound from a crack grenade you see here does D3 damage. So um, uh, so that's how that works. Let's just look at a uh, frag grenade, for example. So if you throw one frag grenade, it has a six inch range, and you it's a grenade D6, so you roll six dice. The strength is three and it does one damage. So um, uh, these are just examples of weapon profiles. So let's do that. So they got bolt guns. So they have eight bolt guns shooting at this unit. They're all within 12 inches. So they're all in rapid fire range. So that means that instead of shooting one shot, they're rapid fire one, they actually shoot two shots each. So there's 16 shots coming through here. Okay, so I've got my 16 dice here. And uh, as I said before, so to shoot somebody, you just look at your ballistic skill, which is three plus, and you have to roll three plus to hit. And uh, uh, go for any modifiers. So there's no modifiers to their hit rolls. So here we go. Just uh, we're gonna roll. We're gonna move the rhino out of the way and roll 16 dice. All right. So I take away all the ones and twos, and that's a very good roll. So all these are hits. So that's how many hits you have. Then you gotta roll uh, to wound. So in order to roll to wound. Again, you just compare strength and toughness. So the strength of the bull comes as four. Let's see what the toughness is for the gene stealers. Okay, so the gene stealers have a toughness of four. So um, you have to consult this chart. And as I mentioned before, this is the chart. So if you're equal strength and toughness, it's just a four plus to wound. And that's it, just a straight up four plus roll. So we're gonna take these hits. And we're gonna roll and see how many four pluses we get. All right, so take away the one, two, threes. So good hit roll has evened out. So we only scored four wounds. 
and each wound we know does one damage. So there's four wounds to allocate. So the your opponent chooses who's gonna take those four wounds, okay? And as someone gets wounded and gets damaged, if they have multiple wounds, they have to keep taking wounds until they die, and then you can pick another model, okay? And the other thing is, uh, yeah, so, so these guys, uh, Gene Steelers, they have just one wound each, and they have a five plus save. Um, so their armor save is five plus, and there's no armor penetration on the bulk gun, so they can take five plus armor. What they also have, is a five plus invulnerable save. So an invulnerable save is another save that the, uh, models can get that is unmodified by armor penetration. And as you're the controlling player taking saves, you can choose whether a unit uses its armor save or its invul invulnerable save when faced with damage, okay? And then, uh, so so that's the difference between armor save and invulnerable save. And then finally, we touch on mortal wounds. So if something does you a mortal wound, that is a super crazy wound. You cannot take any save against that. You cannot take armor or invulnerable saves against mortal wounds, okay? So these are just uh, four normal wounds with no armor penetration, so they can take their five plus armor save. So we're gonna roll four five plus armor saves. All right, so we save one and three wounds go through. So how much damage do the bolt guns do? So on damaging, the bolt guns just do one damage each. So that is three damage that needs to be allocated. So you, I can. these guys only have one wound, so three guys will die. And the controlling player of these guys gets to choose which models to remove. So you no longer have to remove closest models first. You can remove from the back or the side or whatever you prefer. So you can use that decision very strategically, and uh, I'll let you discover how you can use that strategically, but by choosing where you remove models, it can make a big difference. So in this case, we're gonna remove the three dudes at the back. Okay, so three gene sealers are dead. And I put them on the side so we remember how many died in this turn, okay? So that's three gene sealers dead. And that's it. Now, let's go on with our shooting phase. So this squad is still shooting. There are two other weapons in there. So let's shoot with the LAS cannon, okay? So the LAS cannon is a heavy one weapon, strength nine, minus three armor penetration with D6 wounds. So, uh, and it's a heavy weapon with one shot. So he moved, so therefore he can still shoot it, but he's gonna be minus one to hit. So this guy will only hit on a four plus. So here we go. Okay, so he rolls a five, so he hits with the last cannon. And to wound, he's strength nine versus toughness four. That is more than double the, the toughness, therefore he will wound on a two. And he wounds. So now it's gonna be minus three to armor penetration. They have only a five plus save, so minus three makes it impossible, so they get no armor save from that. However, this one wound can be saved with an invulnerable save because that's not modified by armor penetration. So these guys will still get a five plus invulnerable save against this last cannon shot. And they fail. So now I roll damage, which is D6. So first you have to allocate that one wound to do a guy, so he's gonna take it on this guy here, okay? Or well, this guy here is gonna take this last cannon shot. So he's gonna take D6 damage and it's three damage. So he takes all three damage. It doesn't roll over when there's multiple damage per, per wound, okay? So he's gonna take the one damage and die and the other two damage just disappears, okay? It doesn't roll over like uh, damage used to do in 40K. So that's very important. So you say, well, that's quite overkill. What if I put six wounds on him and all I did was kill one guy? Well, that's true because the last can is not designed to kill chaff and infantry is designed to kill tanks where or, or things with multiple wounds okay so you 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 have to choose which weapons you use to shoot what type of enemies and that's part of the strategy of this system now which is different from what it used to be and it used to be that if you put you know four last cannons here and they did six wounds each that's 
at 16 wounds, you could have wiped this whole unit out with four last cannons. Well, how is that possible? How can you kill 20 models with four shots? So, so that doesn't make any sense. So that's how the new system has changed. Okay. And then the melt -a gun uh, will, uh, we won't shoot the melt -a gun for illustrated purposes. So, so that's it. So this unit has shot and the gene stealers have taken four casualties. So in the shooting phase, so the dreadnought can't shoot because he advanced. The um, Rhino can shoot, he has a weapon, but he's not going to choose to shoot, okay? So that's the end of the shooting phase. And then we go into the next, that's the end of the shooting phase. The final thing to say about shooting phase is cover. So the way cover works now is in 7th edition, it used to be that if you were in cover, you get a, a different cover save depending on what kind of terrain you're in. And it was really, really cumbersome. So now what it is, is that you get a cover save, which is just a plus one to your armor save. And that's only if your whole unit is within the terrain piece. Okay, so if we were like this, and there's only one dude in the terrain there, then that unit would not get any bonus to their save from being a cover okay they would all have to be in the terrain and uh the, similarly it says now on data sheets for large models that how much has to be obscured by cover in order for them to get a cover save so that's also been covered for large models no more determining if something's a flying monster's creature or gargantuan if they have a toe and cover no more of that stuff that's all gone this cover has been very simplified um and streamlined So the next phase is the charge phase and the fight phase. So um, what we're going to do is these Marines are not stupid. They're not going to charge Gene Stealers. So they're going to not choose to charge. And the Dreadnought cannot charge because he advanced. And the tank uh, can't charge because he can't actually get through all these guys. So And Ezekiel similarly can't charge because he's behind this wall of Marines. So there's going to be no charge phase and fight phase in this turn for the Dark Angels, but we're going to demonstrate that when we get to the Gene Stealer phase, okay? So the morale phase is uh, now very similar to Age of Sigmar, the Battleshock phase. So what happens now, so it used to be that um, it, you had to lose a certain number of units and then roll against your leadership and and then if you failed you would just start to run away so morale has become simpler and much more important now okay so these gene stealers uh you what you do is you take up each unit has to take if they took loss of any models they have to take a morale test okay and what you do is you take the leadership value of the models so for gene stealers it's nine okay and you need to roll a d6 and you add to it the number of models that they lost for that whole turn so we lost four models for that whole turn so what we're going to do is roll d6 and add four two so two plus four is six so that's below their leadership value of nine so nothing happens they pass their morale check and they stay exactly as they are so let's say they lost four models and we roll the six so now four plus six is ten so ten is one greater than their leadership so you, i would lose a model a model for every point above their leadership so they would lose another gene stealer in the morale phase and now they stay exactly where they are they can do whatever they want next turn but now they have one model less so you can see that low leadership units can really take damage from having uh, poor morale okay and that's the end of dark angel's turn that is uh literally the whole turn and um yeah that's how it works so we're going to go on to now gene stealers uh, turn uh, one and so that we can show you how the combat phase works and we'll also go through the psychic phase again okay we won't do shooting again because these guys don't have any shooting and for the purposes of their turn we're going to put these guys all back okay we'll put three of them back don't want to make it too hard on the marines okay Okay, so uh, we're going into Gene Stealers turn one. So movement phase, Gene Stealers can move seven inches. They're gonna move right up so that they're an inch away from their opponents. Right in your face. That's how they work. 
and the magus can move six so he's actually just going to stay there okay so that's the end of movement phase uh they don't need to advance because now they're within one inch of the model and they want to get in and charge so uh, now we're on the psychic phase so the magus knows um uh, one power and he can cast one power per turn so he's going to cast smite and he's going to cast it on um on these marines so smite was warp charge five so he needs to roll five or more so he rolls in the 11 so that goes off and Ezekiel's within 24 inches, so he can attempt to, uh, to deny. He needs to roll uh, a 12 to deny. And he does not. So Smite goes off. So now we're going to do it. So Smite does D3 damage to the unit. D3 mortal wounds. So I pick a, uh, a person to take it. So this person is going to take D3 mortal wounds. And uh, he takes one mortal wound. But he only has one wound anyway, so he dies. We'll put that there. So we remember how many Marines died in this turn. Okay, so um, so that's the end of Psychic Phase. So there's no shooting, and so we're straight on to Charge Phase. So Charge Phase, so you pick a unit that's going to charge, and they can charge any unit that's within 12 inches. And then um, you can select one or more models within 12 inches to charge. So these gene stealers have selected these marines and the dreadnought as the targets for their charge. So now what happens is anything that has been targeted for charging can make an overwatch attack. And uh, except that when you roll to hit, you have to roll a six to hit. Okay, so gone are the snapshot rules. Now it's just if you overwatch, you need a six to hit. Um, and uh and you can and it's otherwise just like a normal shooting attack you can shoot all your weapons okay so these marines are going to make overwatch so they have uh only seven dudes left now with bolters they're still in rapid fire range so they can make 14 overwatch attacks 14 okay 14 overwatch shots of course hitting on sixes all right so they hit with two of them and wounding on fours like before, four strength, four toughness. So only one wound. So these gene stealers have decided they're gonna take it on this guy at the back here. So he gets a five plus armor save and he passes. So nothing happens from that overwatch. The last cannon can make overwatch and he didn't move this turn. He moved last turn, his turn. He didn't move in the gene stealers turn. So he gets the overwatch on a six and he hits wounds on a two. And he wounds, so that's going to be taken on this guy again. He gets his 5 plus invulnerable save, and he fails. He's going to take d6 damage, 2 damage, so this guy is dead in Overwatch. And then uh, the Melted Gun's not going to shoot because I don't want to deal with that. And then the Dreadnought can make Overwatch. He has one ranged weapon, the Flamer. So the Flamer, Heavy Flamer, does uh, d6 shots and automatically hits because it's a flame weapon. So gone are templates. No more templates just uh the te what used to be a template now just takes uh, a d6 or d3 or like a rolled number of shots so and automatically hits to 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 simulate the template effect so d6 so two hits automatically hit uh it's strength six i believe anyway i don't need to look it up strength six versus toughness four so that's a three to wound two hits sorry so uh just one wound so one wound uh, will be taken on this guy. So uh, there's no armor penetration. So uh, five plus armor and he, pa fa pa uh, and he passes. So you can see that templates are still good in Overwatch because you don't have that six to hit, you automatically hit. So um, oh, we only lost one guy in Overwatch. Okay, the next part of the charge phase is the charge itself. So now after you've taken your Overwatch, now you roll 2d6 to see how far you can charge. And they charge eight, and obviously they're just within one inch, so they will make their charge. So how you move is the first model you move has to end up within one inch of an enemy model that was one of your targets. So let's say this guy moves in here, boom. And then, um, now keep in mind, you don't need to move all the way to base to base, okay? You just have to be within an inch. If that serves you some tactical advantage, then use it but you don't have to be in base to base you just have to be within an inch okay and then these guys everyone else can move up to their charge distance to be within an inch of any of their targets 
okay? And you cannot move to be within an inch of something that you didn't charge. So unlike AOS, you can't pull people into combat by moving within their space, okay? So, so if you didn't charge, if we didn't declare a charge on the dreadnought, this guy would not be able to move in here because he would be within an inch of the dreadnought, okay? So that would not be possible. Um, and you can move in any way as long as you end up closer to the enemy model than you began with, okay? So these guys are all just going to go straight in. So actually this guy is going to come this way so we can attack the dreadnought. These guys are all going to go straight in and we're going to have a combat here, okay? Now, at this point, after the charge is made, any characters that are within three inches of an enemy unit can perform what they call heroic intervention and get themselves into the combat. So Ezekiel here is now within three inches of the Gene Stealer unit that just made a charge. So he can perform a heroic intervention and move up to three inches uh, to try and get into combat. And all he has to do is move so that he ends up closer to the enemy models. So he's going to move forward here and make a heroic intervention. And now he can participate in this combat. Okay, so that is something that characters can do, make a heroic intervention. Okay, so that's the end of the charge phase. Uh, and so you do that for every unit that you want to charge across the board. Okay. Okay, so let's go through the fight phase now. For in the fight phase, you choose the unit that you're gonna fight with. So this is how it works. If you charged, so it's your turn in your charge phase, in the fight phase, all the units that charged get to attack first before any, uh, any of the enemy uh, 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 units, okay? So if I had four units across this board and they were all charged, then I could choose which of those four I wanna go in what order, but they all get to attack first before any of my opponent's models get to attack back. After all the charging units have attacked, then it alternates activation, starting with the player whose turn it is. So I would actually get to attack uh, even the so the the models that I had already in combat from like a previous turn would then get to attack and then my mo uh, my opponent gets to pick a unit that attacks and then vice versa just like Age of Sigmar and alternates in terms of activation okay but importantly in 40k the charging unit gets to go first all your charging units get to go first which is a significant boost to assault play in 40k from 7th edition okay so um so that's how you choose the unit to activate with so when you choose the unit to activate in you get to do what's called a pile in and the pile in is basically a three inch move that your unit can your models can make uh, in any way that you want as long as it ends up closer to the nearest enemy model than where it began okay we don't need to make any pile-ins in this case because we're already all stuck in combat. And if you're already within an inch of the model, you can't pile in to somewhere else because you have to go towards the nearest model and that by definition is the nearest model. So if you're already stuck in combat, there's no pile-in. But um, uh, when it becomes the Marine's turn, for example, this last cannon could make a three inch move to get into combat to pile in, okay? And same with this melt again. So that's what the pile-in move is. And then what you do is you look at your uh, melee weapons, so the, so melee weapon profiles are very much the same as shooting weapons, except that instead of uh, what kind of range weapon it is, it just says melee and melee, okay? And then there's a strength, armor penetration, and damage, just like before, okay? So um, now you figure out where you're going to put all your attacks. And so if you have multiple attacks, so Gene Steelers each have three attacks, you can, in fact, um, split them however you want between models. So I could say, for example, so these two guys are going to attack the Dreadnought and the rest of these guys are going to attack their Marines. Okay? Or I could say, this guy's going to attack the Dreadnought, this guy's going to put one attack into the Dreadnought and two attacks into this Marine because he's also within an inch of this Marine and all these guys will attack Marines. So you can split them with such granularity as you wish, okay? And then you roll for them all separately. So what we're gonna do now, uh, so these two guys are gonna fight the Dreadnought and these five guys are gonna fight Marines, okay? So then you roll your attacks. So what do you do? So how many attacks is that? So they have three attacks each. So one, two, three, four, five guys. So 15 attacks going into the Marines. Let's do that first. Three, six, nine, 12, 15 attacks going into the Marines. 
Their weapon skill is three plus. Okay. Now, so they would need a three plus to hit. Now remember, Ezekiel cast a version on them in his turn, which gave them a minus one to hit modifier. Okay, and that's just to hit. It doesn't say shooting or me or combat attacks. It's just across the board to hit. So therefore, they actually get a minus one. So they're only hitting on four pluses in this combat. Okay, so fifteen rending claw attacks on the Marines, minus one to hit. So four plus. That's a pretty good roll, above average for sure. Okay, so now the strength of the attacks is the user, and their user strength is four, and the toughness is four. So four on four, four plus the wound. It's a cocked dice. All right, so now we have, oh, there's a dice over here. Now we have um, six wounds, okay? So the thing about the rending claws for the gene stealers uh, is that if you roll a six or more to wound, then that hit becomes AP minus four instead of what it is normally, which is minus one, okay? So now the Marine player can choose to allocate these wounds. So what he's going to do is say, okay, so this Marine over here is going to take this crazy rending wound um, and then we'll start with that. So AP minus four means that he has a three plus save, but minus four means he has no save. There's no invulnerable save uh, for Space Marines. So he takes one damage and so he's dead. So this guy's dead. And then there's five more wounds. So, and they're just one damage each. So we'll just roll them out and see how many Marines die. And they're AP minus one. So Marines have three plus save, armor save. So that goes to a four plus armor save. All right, so I failed two, so two more Marines die. And again, I'll take them from the back. Sorry, I was silly. Uh, leave him there. I'll take him from the back and uh, this guy here. All right, so two Marines died in that volley of attacks. And so that's still their attacks, because remember I said these two guys are attacking the Dreadnought. So these two guys will attack the Dreadnought. So three attacks each again. And minus one to hit still. So four plus. All right, only two hits, and the Dreadnought's toughness is uh, seven, so they're, it's not quite double four, so they're gonna need fives to wound, and there's no wound, so they did not manage to scratch the Dreadnought. Okay, and uh, that's the end of the close combat attacks for the Gene Stealer side. So now at the end of that, if they had other units that had charged, they could then do that, but they haven't. So then it's this player's turn to pick a unit that was already locked in combat, of which there are none. So now it's actually Dark Angel's turn to pick a unit that's locked in combat to attack. And so he will pick these um, Space Marines. So they get to make their three inch pile in. So this last cannon can make a pile in three inches as long as it gets closer to the model. And this Melted Gun can pile in here and Ezekiel is already in combat. So you count as co in combat if you're within one inch of a model or if you're in one inch of a model that is within one inch of a model. So that is different from seventh edition where it was two inches, now it's one inch, okay? So Ezekiel's in combat by being virtue of one inch away from his Marines which are in combat. So we're gonna attack with the Marines first. So tactical squad, just get one attack. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys now. All right. And they don't have any um, special uh, melee weapons. So it's just uh, hitting on threes. And then strength four, toughness four, wounding on fours. So two wounds. Uh, and it just does one damage with no armor penetration. So we're gonna take it on um, this guy here. So just one damage each, so five plus armor save. All right, he passes one and he fails one, so he's dead. Okay, so the Marines killed one. And then it's back to the Gene Stealer player's turn, but he has no other units in combat. So back again to the Dark Angel's turn. So now we're gonna do the Dreadnought. All right, let's see what happens with the Dreadnought. So the Dreadnought has four attacks. And he hits on a three plus. And he's gonna put both his attacks uh, into this unit, obviously. 
so he missed with two. So two hits, and the strength, his strength is six, but his weapon, combat weapon, multiplies his strength times two. So his strength is 12, their toughness is only four, so he needs twos to wound. So that's two wounds, and it's minus three Ren, so they have no armor save, but as we know, Gene Steelers have a five plus invulnerable save, which is not modified by armor penetration. So they get uh, two wounds with five plus uh, invuln saves. And they pass them both, which is lucky because each of those would have done three damage, which would have killed only two Gene Steelers, but still. So they passed them both, so no damage done by the Dreadnought. And then finally, we attack with Ezekiel. So Ezekiel has three attacks, and uh, he's hitting on two pluses. So he failed one still, so two hits, and his weapon is the Traitor's Bane, um, and it is plus one strength, so his strength is four, so five strength on four toughness, so wounding on threes. That's two wounds, and it is uh, minus three to rend. Uh, again, they, they have no armor save, but they get their invulnerable saves. So two invulnerable saves. And it passes one, so one the guy will take D3 damage. It doesn't matter though because he's he only has one wound, so he's gonna die too. Alright, so Ezekiel killed another one. And that's the end of this uh, combat phase. So uh, at the end of the combat phase you can consolidate. So these guys are already in uh, consolidation is just like another three inch paladin, whoever can do it. So these guys can't because they're already up to their models. But these three guys who are out here could make their paladins to get closer to the enemy model. Okay. Okay, that's the end of combat phase. So now we're on to morale phase. So it's Gene Steeler's player's turn. So he takes his morale phase first. So he lost three models plus D6. So 2 plus 3 is 5, his leadership was 9, so he's fine, he doesn't lose anymore. The Marines have a leadership of uh, 7, but their sergeant is still alive, he has a leadership of 8. So D6 plus 3 guys lost, so 2 plus 5, so that's again uh, just 5, so that's below their leadership, so they're fine, they don't lose anymore models either and that's the end of the gene stealers turn one and this is how the game has ended up um, so that's basically it that's how you play through a turn and we play through turns on both sides the final thing i want to talk about is transports uh, so we already talked about transports and what capacity they can carry and the keywords how that affects it and what you can do is at the start of the game you can put your people who are in that transport don't have to start on the field if they're in the transport. And while people are in transports, they do not interact with anything. Their auras and busts and stuff don't work. So it's like they're not even on the field when they're inside the transport, unless there's a special rule that specifically says so. And in the movement phase, you can embark, uh, disembark from a transport. And when you disembark, you move and your units must be able to set up within three inches of the transport okay and less and of course greater than more than an inch away from any enemy models any units that can't get out in that way are dead okay um gone are the access points so you don't have to deploy from the back and all that stuff is gone okay and then after you disembark you can move advance shoot and charge as normal so restrictions to that are all gone as well so transports become very good okay and then if you want to embark you just have to end up uh similarly um, within three inches of it at the end of your movement phase and then your unit can embark in the transport again okay so transports are very simple uh, much simplified and way more strategic use of transports it's gonna get you far so thanks for watching that's my how to play video of Warhammer 40k 8th edition I hope that's been useful both for new players and for players coming through from 7th or returning from previous editions of Warhammer um, I encourage everyone just to grab some models and grab the core rules and just start to play you can find the core rules online even as early as now not in official way but leaked they've all been leaked by Warhammer by GW and as well as other sites including ourselves we've got the whole core rulebook uh, out on a video on our channel here and just start playing and uh, it's 
so easy to learn now. Uh, whereas previously I needed a 10 part series on how to play 40K. Now I just need one video. And if I wanted to, I can make another video on how to build armies and stuff. But you know, you just read that in the rule book. It's very straightforward now. And I'll let you discover that by yourselves. So that's our how to play uh, Warhammer 40k 8th edition. Uh, thanks very much for your support here on uh, uh, on Canhammer. Uh, you can find us, of course, at canhammer.ca, Facebook forward slash uh, Canhammer, YouTube forward slash Canhammer, and you're watching right now, and Instagram uh, at Canhammer underscore YT. And if you really would like to support the work that we're doing here on the channel, uh, please feel free to go over to patreon.com forward slash can hammer and support us there so happy gaming guys enjoy the new edition there's going to be lots more eighth edition content uh, coming up here on uh, can hammer so stay tuned and thanks for watching